All right, hello church. It's so good to be back with you again uh, today and we're done with our study of the nature of the church. My prayer though is that you learn to appreciate the diversity of the church, the purpose of the church, and really appreciate the fact that you were called out for a reason, for a purpose, and that you can't just be an inactive member of the body of Christ. I mean, you can, but we're here to encourage you to become an active member in the body of Christ. He saved you for a purpose. If you didn't get that from the Nature of the Church series, please go back to episode one and watch it through again. Haha. <laughs> um, shameless plug. So, I just wanted to encourage you as we uh, are separated that the body of Christ still has a function and that you still have a purpose. In our mission, we're still to be worshiping God in spirit and in truth, okay? And with that attitude in mind, we come into our next series. Probably going to be a four to five to six part series. Um, these next couple weeks, I really want to dive in and look at what it means to worship, okay? Um, to worship God, there has to be a catalyst for worship. The human has to understand their position before God, right? They have to worship God with everything that they are. And then there has to be a response, a change in their life. So we're, we're going to look at this, uh, look at what it is, what worship is, and how do we worship, why do we worship, and then our response to that worship. And we're going to start out uh, by looking at a couple different stories throughout the Bible of where people were brought to their knees before the awesomeness of God. And they worshiped so genuinely and with so much passion that they came away changed because they understood how awesome their God was. See, we worship something all the time. By definition, worship is giving adoration or an expression of reverence to something. And in our case, it's to be a giving of adoration and an expression of reverence to God, okay? This week, we're gonna be examining the time that Abraham took Isaac to Mount Moriah, okay? So, Genesis 22, is the passage we're going to be looking at today. So if you want to turn there in your Bible, go ahead and do that. Um, before we jump into chapter 22, though, real quick, I want to give you some context, though, because we don't want to uh, just jump in here in a vacuum, okay? So Genesis 22, uh, where Abraham and Isaac uh, worship God together, starts in Genesis chapter 21, where uh, 21, where Isaac is born, okay? Which is a miracle, okay? Remember that Abraham was promised a child, and after so many years, Abraham decided to take things into his own hands, and he has a child with Hagar, his handmaiden. And then one day, the child, Ishmael, uh, after he had grown up a little bit, was making fun of something, presumably to do with Isaac, and the son, uh, Isaac was the son of Sarah and Abraham instead of Ishmael, who was the son of Abraham and Hagar. And so we have Ishmael. He's, he's kind of laughing, making fun of uh, presumably Isaac. And Sarah isn't going to have that. That's her boy. And she is his, uh, he is her only son. So Sarah has Hagar and Ishmael sent away into the desert of Beersheba. The desert. Wow. Uh, she wasn't happy. Abraham eventually made a peace treaty with the people of Beersheba, and he ended up living in the land of Beersheba, the land of the Philistines, for a long time. And that's also where Hagar and Ishmael ended up uh, being taken care of as well. So that's the context coming from chapter one, Isaac's born. There's a, you know, controversy here with between Ishmael and Isaac and Sarah and Hagar and then chapter 22 opens and we're going to start reading in verse 1 okay so Genesis 22 verse 1 now it came to pass after these things that we just talked about that God tested Abraham and said to him Abraham and he said here am I then he said take now your son your only son, Isaac, 
whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and the lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. And Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father! And his father said, Hear my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for this burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. I mean, there's some tension building here. Isaac has no idea that God has asked Abraham to do this. Isaac's carrying the wood. You can feel the tension here, all right? So, uh, right off the bat, starting in verse 1, we're going to see that Abraham is sensitive and approachable, ready to do God's will, okay? He says the one Hebrew word, okay, we have here am I, it's actually one Hebrew word called henanai, okay? It means here I am. It's simple, it's basic, but it confirms that he is sensitive to the moving of God in his life. So it is interesting to note right off the bat that God asked Abraham to do something. But, and, and Abraham is right there, Hanani, but it's in direct violation of God's law, of God's nature. This is a very curious um, ask of God. See, Deuteronomy 12 and verse 31 says this, you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abomination to the Lord, which he hates, they have done to their gods. For they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. So this is later on in the book of Deuteronomy. God tells the Israelites, you shall not burn your sons and daughters like the gods of the Philistines and the Canaanites and the people of the land. No, not going to happen. That, that's not honoring to God because God created man in his image and they all have intrinsic value, right? Later on in Deuteronomy 18, Deuteronomy 18 and verse 10, it says this, There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire. And once again, this is another passage where he's telling them, do not do the things of the gods or the people of the land that you live in, okay? So then, in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 21, it says, You shall not give any of your children to offer them to Moloch, and so profane the name of the Lord your God. I am the Lord. Okay? So, right off the bat, here's a couple passages where God's like, no child sacrifice, no human sacrifice, I should say. No human sacrifice to the Lord God. Humans have value. They have worth. So this ask of God to Abraham, quite curious. Although it is before the rest of that stuff was written. But understand that. However, since none of that has been written at this point in history, right? I just said that. We do know from the text of the Phoenicians and the Punic peoples of North Africa um, that they did practice these things. And like I said, the Philistines as well. So Abraham is not surprised by this ask of God. Um, see, in, in the writing of this, it says um, that God is testing Abraham. Okay, right off the bat. <clears throat> Whoops. Got to go back. Right off the bat. Now, in verse 1, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. Okay, so we know that initially as well. But note, it does not say that uh, 
it does not say that Abraham said this was a test, okay? God tested Abraham. Once again, you got to understand what the passage says and then note what it doesn't say. It does not say that Abraham knew this was a test. Abraham was so trusting of God at this point in his life that he is willing to do anything he says. And you know, as a side note, before we come to uh, worship, uh, where are you at in your relationship with God, okay? We just saw that Abraham, he was so sensitive. He was willing to do anything God asked. Where are you at in your relationship with God? Are you humble? Uh, are you willing to do anything that he asks at any time? See, that's the first step of worship, readily acknowledging God's place in your life, being totally in submission to God, nothing held back. Okay, see, as we look at this and we ask, how in the world could Abraham possibly sacrifice his son um, Isaac? We have to remember what God had promised Abraham in chapter 21 in verse 12. Okay, we talked a little bit about chapter 21, but we didn't really get into it, so I'll read it. Verse 12 says, But God said to Abraham, Do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman, the Ishmael and Hagar. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. For in Isaac your seed shall be called. Yet I will also make a nation of the son of the bondwoman because he is your seed. So the son the, of promise is Isaac. Now Ishmael, because he is Abraham's son, is also going to be made a nation as well. But Isaac is the son of promise here. And this goes back even further in Genesis. Okay? God says, through Isaac, your offspring will be named. Okay? Because we see this here, we also know in Hebrews 11, <clears throat> Hebrews 11 in verse 17 through 19, it says this about this whole situation. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Okay, so understand, right off the bat, he trusted God's promise that Isaac is the child of promise, okay? And Abraham believed that even if I kill him because of God's command, God will raise him from the dead to continue his promise, okay? This is unbelievable faith. It's awesome to see. God promised him a child, okay? Abraham, he promised Abraham a child. And uh, Abraham here is being tested as to whether or not he truly believes that because as we just read, Ishmael is going to be made a nation as well, but he is not going to be the people of Israel here. He, the, the seed, the name, is going to go through Isaac. And you'll find it interesting that, you know, in both of these passages, in, in the Deuteronomy one, or in the Genesis one, and the Hebrews one, it says that he offered his only son. Interesting too, right? Because it's not his only son. Just one chapter earlier, we found out he has another one. But we'll get more to that later. So the question is, right, practical. Do you trust God? Do you believe what he says in his word? Because that's how Satan gets us, right? That's how he got Adam and Eve. Has God really said this? Satan attacks because we doubt. Do you believe what God says in his word? Okay. There's so many promises and there's so much study in here about God. Do you believe what this word says about God? And then do you believe what this word says about your relationship with God? Because that is so vital. And it's the, the relationship with God is being tested here with Abraham. So starting in verse 9, let's read through the rest of the chapter real quick. Okay, Genesis 22 verse 9. Then they came to the place of which God had told them, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood uh, in order, and he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am, Hanani, right? And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know 
that you fear God. Since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of a place, The Lord will provide, Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, In the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars in the heavens and as sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they arose and went together to Beersheba and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. And then there's more blessing to Abraham through his family as you, as you finish off the chapter here. But you can see right off the bat, notice that they come after three days travel they come to the place that the Lord has uh, told them to go to. And they arrive in verse 9, okay? And he builds an altar, right? So they came to the place which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order, and he bound his son Isaac, and he laid him on the, on the altar upon the wood. So Abraham here is very resolute, okay? At this point, he's all steam in the head, right? It's go, go time. There's no hesitation. There's no doubt here. This is like very resolute. Each act builds on each other, okay? So initially, it says uh, that he, in verse two, he says, now take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, of which I shall tell you. So, and then, later on here in, let's see here, verse five, you're gonna notice, and Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, the lad and I are gonna go over here and we're gonna worship and we will come back to you. I mean, Abraham is resolute here and he says they're going to worship. Interesting. There's so many uh, steps or little things that Abraham does to set this up, right? He goes to God's perfect purposed place. He builds an altar, arranges the wood, binds Isaac, uh, arranges him on the wood that is on the altar, which as a father, I'm sure is no easy task. Can't even imagine. Abraham says that him and his son are going to worship, right? In verse five that we just read. But in verse 10, he reaches out his hand to kill the son whom he loves. For him, the obedience is complete. At this point, the angel of the Lord calls from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, and what is his response? Same word, Hanani, here I am, again. Six other times this word of, is used of people in referring uh, or responding to God's call. Here in Genesis 21, later on in Genesis 31, verse 11, when God appears to Jacob in a dream. After that, Genesis 46, verse 2, when God tells Jacob to move to Egypt. Then in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 4, when God called him from the burning bush, he says, here am I, Hen and I. And then 1 Samuel 3, 4, when the Lord calls Samuel. That's a pretty popular one, right? We know this one. And then Isaiah 6, 8, when God calls Isaiah. Another pretty popular one that we know. Isaiah responds, Hen and I. There's one that I find really interesting, and it's in the New Testament as well. Um, it's in Acts. Acts 9 and verse 10. 
God tells Ananias to go to Paul after his conversion. And Ananias' response, his first response is, here I am. So Abraham again here says, Henani. And the Lord says, you did not withhold your son, your only son, from me. Where else was this kind of heart change or heart devotion seen? Okay, this is extreme devotion. <clears throat> it's in 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 18. And the Lord said to David, my father, Whereas it is in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well. It was in your heart. Like, he was so resolute on building the house for God that God acknowledges that to him. Like, I see you have every intention of doing this. And that's where Abraham is here. It's go time. That knife is going to come down. So here we see with Abraham, God provides the sacrifice. But the heart of the matter is what God wants to see here. There are a lot of parallels here with the gospel of the New Testament, right? First is obviously they go to Mount Moriah. This is a three-day journey. This is quite an extensive journey. Uh, they go to Mount Moriah, which is arguably Jerusalem. Some people say that it was another random mountain in Israel because Jerusalem was too far away. But if you look at the, the map and you look at all the uh, landmarks and stuff, Jerusalem makes the most sense here. Where Christ would later be sacrificed for the sins of the world. Okay, So the loading of the wood onto Isaac also brings us to think of John 19 and verse 17. Where Jesus is said to carry his own wooden cross. And Isaac is carrying the wood that he would be sacrificed on. But the fire and the knife are in the Father's hands. The victim and the office, uh, or the, the person that's going to execute the judgment here, or the sacrifice, the sacrificer and the sacrifice are both walking together, which foreshadows Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 10, which talks about Jesus being led as a lamb to the slaughter. So God walking Jesus all the way to the cross. Huge difference here though, right? Jesus knew that this was coming, and he still went to the cross. Isaac presumably did not know until the last couple minutes here. Um, it is interesting to note, though, in verse 16, um, that God says, you have not withheld your only son. I said I would bring this up again, right? He obviously wasn't his only son. Again, though, it was his only son with the promise, though, right? The promise was that Abraham would have a child and that that child, from that child, would come all these people. Abraham's lack of faith led him to pursue God's will another way. And so God is giving him a second chance here to really see if Abraham trusts him completely this time. See, the first time Abraham failed and he went and he got with Hagar, and they had Ishmael. And so he tried accomplishing God's will his own way. And here, God is testing Abraham again to see, okay, I gave him the child. He didn't believe me the first time. Now I'm going to take the child away from him and see where his heart is now. And we see a big change in Abraham's heart. There is no wavering or faltering at all in his resolution here. If there was any wavering of faith, or if Abraham thought that he could bring about the promise of God in any other way, then God would have seen that. But there is absolutely no wavering here, and he believes what God has said. That's amazing. So God reassures him of his covenant that was in chapter 15 and verse 5, right? Chapter 15 of Genesis and verse 5. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now towards heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. In verse 6 he says, And he believed the Lord, and, it, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Okay? So here we see God testing Abraham. If there was any wavering in his heart, God would have seen it. But God said, 
your resolution is so firm, your faith in me is so firm, stop. I see your heart. Let's ask ourselves that question. Do you remember the promises of God year after year, even if you don't see the desired change? Even if you don't see the changes that you've wanted or you've desired, do you maintain your faith that God has a plan? Do you maintain your faith that God has a purpose? Or do you lose faith and you question everything and you try and make things happen your own way? This is huge here in this story that God would give Abraham the opportunity to show his faith here. I mean, that, it's an odd way to look at it, but you know, I look at things from different ways and I see, that, I see this as like an opportunity for Abraham. Abraham doesn't know it. God knows that he's testing him, but Abraham's like, I'm gonna do this. So Abraham calls this place Jehovah Jireh because it means the Lord will provide, okay? This word has a lot of meaning provide, right? Do you believe that God will provide for you? Think of what God provided here. You know, once again, this is an awkward way to look at it, but an opportunity for faith, an opportunity for incredible failure, the chance to waver, an opportunity for assurance, an opportunity for God to shine. See, there's different ways to look at it, a positive and a negative way. What we believe is important. How we view God and his word is important. And it should lead us to worship. Look at the faithfulness of God in your life, okay? Maybe there's times when you've had to sacrifice. Times of great faith are not often given during easy circumstances, right? Time to have great faith and great worship are often found in the fire. Think of, I, as soon as I say that, I think of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, literally in the fire, in the struggle. And we say, but I don't like that. But that's how your faith grows. How God proves himself faithful to you. See, he gave Abraham an opportunity here for Abraham to fail, but he gave him an opportunity to see the faithfulness of God. God will provide. He learned incredibly uh, incredible amounts through this. So providing uh, reminders that we are to worship God alone and not the creation, right? This is, in, this is built into this story. When you're going through times of struggle, worship. When you're going through times of great joy, worship. Think of his word. Read his word and pray. Say, thank you. Say, I love you, God. Say, you are so good. And then maybe the hard times, right? We say, I need you. We always need him though, right? But sometimes we forget that until we're put in those hard situations. So is God testing you today? So in conclusion, beginning today, I said we would look at what is worship. At the very beginning of this, I said we're going to be looking at what is worship, and we're going to go through a couple different stories in the Bible to see this, where they, where they worship. See, Abraham told his two servants that went with him, look, me and Isaac, even though God told him, you're going to go to this mountain and sacrifice your only son that you love, Abraham said, me and Isaac are going to worship. Because Abraham's faith that we know from Hebrews 11 is so strong that he knows Isaac is coming back from the dead even if he kills him. So it's an opportunity to worship. A three-day journey to go worship? I look at that and I'm like, oh, it's kind of weird. But God led him there. Why so far away? He could have done it, you know, because it's a foreshadow. And you can see that later on. It's called progressive revelation, where we see in part in the Old Testament, I mean, we're, what, 16 pages into the Bible. But what, by the time we get to the end, we can see why. It's foreshadowing the sacrifice 
of Christ for the sins of the whole world. His and Isaac's worship was going to be setting up an altar and sacrificing to God. When we worship today, we should be setting aside time, maybe even a place, where we come before God and we make a sacrifice. And you say, I have nothing to burn. Ah, that's not what I mean. Look at Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, okay? Go to, go to Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, and it tells us, kind of uh, gives us an idea of what's going on here. Once again, look how far, much further we are into the Bible now. I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Oh, so we're presenting our bodies. A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay? We are to be living sacrifices, which... God doesn't tie us to the altar. Like uh, Genesis 22 says, uh, he tied Isaac, he bound him, and he put him on the altar. In Romans, we see that we're supposed to be living sacrifices. Now, a living sacrifice can get up off the altar. We shouldn't be getting up. We're supposed to be living it every day. We're supposed to be sacrificing to our God and King, our lives. Use the time to worship God. Time of praise, time of prayer, a time of dedication of yourself to Him and His will for your life. Get out of your own way and focus solely on Him. Make God the center of your life. Refocus on Him. Another question I would ask is, uh, I asked at the beginning was, why do we worship? We recognize God's rule in our lives as supreme. We drop everything for him. We take those moments of pure worship to praise him, focus on his word, recognizing all the things he's done in our lives that day, that week, that year. It's been a rough year. Okay, I'll give you that. What about today? What has God done for you today? And what is your response to what he has done? The worst thing you can do as a child of his is to ignore what he has done. I think of my own children and uh, the times when I don't see the recognition of what we as parents do for them, right? Uh, Or the times when they do recognize it. And that's really special, okay? The worst thing that you can do as a follower of Christ is to ignore what Christ did for you or what Christ is doing for you every day. That's the worst thing we can do. You cannot do this to God as a worshiper and follower of Christ. And I say you cannot. You should not, right? We worship because daily, hourly, we receive blessings from him. This year looks crazy. I'll be perfectly honest. This is an insane year. But don't look at that. How about the last hour? the last day. He has done great things and we can worship him because of his mercy and grace given to us daily. Why did Abraham and Isaac worship? Because they were open to God's moving in their life and they acted upon it. And then lastly, what is our response to the worship? Abraham's response was to make a name of the place so that he would remember it. We are never told whether or not he actually ever went back to Mount Moriah to recount the great thing that God did that day. I mean, I'm going to go out on a limb and say he probably did. But think about Isaac. Isaac must have lived in light of that moment for the rest of his life. It had to make a huge impact on the rest of his life. The time his father almost killed him, but God provided? See, Those times in our life where God causes us to realize we are not in control, those times in our life where we sacrifice ourselves, when we become a living sacrifice for him, those are the times in our life that should cause us to worship. And as as people who are supposed to be worshiping both in spirit and in truth, 
and we're supposed to be picking up our cross daily and following him, the idea is that as we sacrifice, like this sacrifice of Isaac, we are to worship. See, Abraham remembered the promise of God, and therefore he was faithful, and he went to Mount Moriah. Our response to worship, then, could simply be writing down the great things that God has done for us. Do it in a journal. Um, do it in your phone, in your phone notes. I talk to my phone all the time. My notes, I could write books off of. It could be, um, as I saw a professor in college, uh, to be perfectly honest, he's, he was actually my golf coach too. And what he would do in his house is he had little scriptures that he would print out and he put them all over the house. Like I was shocked when I went over to their house to see these things because they were a reminder everywhere he went in the house of a verse that reminded him of a time that he worshiped God or a time when God moved in a miraculous way and so he could then worship now. You know, there's, there's all kinds of things that we can do, but he would leave them in specific places and you can do this too. It's pretty, it's pretty simple if you have, you know, you can put reminders on your phone, you could write things down. I like to, personally, I wanna, my idea is I wanna print them out as well, put the verses on paper and put them around the house. And, and hopefully uh, my kids will pick up on that as well because you know we're trying to teach the next generation, right? And I'm sure Isaac learned a lot from this situation as well, not just Abraham. We forget so easily, and so that's what I'm, I'm hoping uh, to push you to do, is to remember. So I hope you're moved to worship this week, okay? I pray that you are encouraged by the story of God's faithfulness to Abraham, and that it moves you to do something, to build in reminders into your life, which brings me to my questions for the week. Print these out, print out these questions of the week, uh, write them down as reminders in your house this week, okay? Number one, question of the week. What has God done today or this week that causes you to stop what you're doing and worship him? What has he done today? What has he done within the last hour? What has he done within the last day, the last week? Think about it. Stop and worship. Number two, second question of the week. What are you doing daily to remind yourself of his faithfulness? So I want you to think about something you can do. Write, write them down on cards. Uh, put them in your Bible. Put them uh, by the door. Put them by your sink. What are you doing today to remind yourself of God's faithfulness? Both in his word and in your everyday life. What are you doing today? What am I doing today? I think I'm gonna start writing down reminders today. And then, if you're doing nothing, I would encourage you to start. Because not having a plan for spiritual growth is devastating to the growth of the believer. And reminding yourself of God's faithfulness daily, or even weekly, is a solid start, okay? So, with that said, thank you for listening. I hope this was encouraging to you. I hope you, this causes you to worship and that you build these things into your life. I love you, church, and I will see you later.